Hi, this is Katina from Ask a Clarinet Teacher and the Clarinet Project, and I am here today to answer your burning clarinet questions. So if you have anything that you would like to know, go ahead and put them in the chat. And David already has one. Can you play extremely high notes? Well, it depends on how you define extremely high. So I can play high notes, and I usually only do them when I have pieces that I have to play. So for instance, uh, uh, Martino set for clarinet has high C's and B's and A sharps and B flats. So those are up in there and I can play those when I play that piece. The Henisterra variations goes up to a C sharp. So I've played those. I am not one of those people that noodles around up there very much just because I, I have other things that I'm interested in playing, but yes, absolutely. Um, I've had some requests for playing up there for tutorials for some of the scales. So currently my scales stop for three octave scales at a high G, the G scale, and people have asked for the A flat and the A, let me go ahead and mute this. So A, A flat, A, B, B flat, and C scales to add that third octave in there. So those are tutorials that are in the works for sure. How about you? Can you play the high notes? <laughs> so put that in the chat. Um, Jelly says, hello, David. Hi, do I have an A flat piccolo? Do I have one? No, but do I want one? Yes, and I am constantly on the lookout for one. So that is one of my wish list clarinets. I have a bass with the low C extension. I have an alto clarinet. I have an A and a couple B flats, E flat clarinet, but I don't have the A flat and I really, really want one. There is no reason for me to have one except for clarinet choir and its adorableness. So. Yeah, I totally want one. Do you have one? Um, <laughs> Cat Lover, hey, how are you doing? It's been a while. It has been a while. Cat Lover, since you were with me from the beginning, um, and anybody else that's here that was there from the beginning, I have some good news to share with everybody. So I have a kitten named Kiki. She just turned one, so I guess she's not a kitten anymore. And in May, she was diagnosed with feline infectious peritonitis. It's called FIP. It is a fatal disease for cats. And we thought we were gonna have to put her to sleep, but instead I decided to try some black market drugs from China. And she was on those for 84 days. She had to get a shot for 84 days. And then right about halfway through, we switched to pills for her because the shots were really, really painful. And she had these big sores and welts on her back. Anyway, she's FIP free. She had her blood work and she doesn't have FIP anymore. Now she has an 84 day waiting period to see if she's going to make it. So for anybody that's been following me uh, on my personal Instagram, I've been posting about Kiki and I have a little save Kiki hashtag. We did a GoFundMe for her. Um, so anyway, Kiki's doing great. So thanks for everybody for rooting for her. Um, clarinet love chromatic scale, please. Yes, we will definitely talk about that. Says, me too you want to need a flat for sure and then clarinet love says please chromatic scale i like how you said chromatic scale please and then you're like please chromatic scale and then you want me to play the highest note i'll play the highest note that i can play sure and david says no um and isabel says have you taught me to play hedwig's theme can you play it you have taught me to play hedwig's theme oh and can i play that one um and cat lover says yeah it's amazing i was going to ask about her yes thank you for asking yeah it's amazing i and and the thing is with kiki and i should put a video up for us for you guys just to see she couldn't use her back legs so she was dragging them and now she can run around and play with her brother it's crazy how this works and it's a shame that it's not been approved by the fda but it hasn't because they are going to try and approve it for people for the current coronavirus that we have so they're saving that for people instead of passing it off for cats okay and i like how i said passing it off like it's a scale test all right so let's talk about the chromatic scale all right, we're going to start at the bottom, and I'm going to show you a very efficient way to learn the chromatic scale. The chromatic scale is a lot of notes. Break it up into pieces. It's easier for our brains to absorb information when we break it up into pieces. So if you think about a phone number, 215-269-0688, you break it into little chunks instead of just running all those numbers together. We're going to break up the chromatic scale into little chunks. Let's start down here on the low E, and I'm going to show you how to go about doing this. We're going to do five notes at a time. So just do E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp. That's it. Stop right there. Just five. Then 
and do the next five. G sharp, A, A sharp, B, C. And then C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E. And just do that octave. So you're doing three groups of five, and you start on each note you land on again. You're dovetailing everything together. Do that going down. Once you get that octave done, do the second octave. I'm going to show you the second octave here just so I can, there's a special part about it I want to talk about. So we're going to start in E. So if you do the E, F, F sharp on the side, G, G sharp. The big thing with the chromatic scale is you must keep your fingers curved and close. I talk about this in my videos all the time. Keeping your fingers curved and close is how um, you'll be able to play faster. So if you think about a pianist, how they're all over the place in the keyboard, they're moving their fingers around, but they'll have resting places, places where they have their fingers ready to go before they start or after rests. They will put their fingers right there and prepare them for that. We don't have to move all over the place, so really we don't have any excuse for not having our fingers curved and close and our pinkies resting on these home keys here. All right, so we just did E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp. Now we're gonna do G sharp, a, keeping them close, A sharp, which is B flat, and B, C. Once you hit that C or that B right here, all those fingerings you've already done are repeats. So you've got B, C, C sharp, D, D sharp, E, F, F sharp, G, G sharp, A, A sharp, B, C. And then you'll go into the altissimo range. I have a bunch of videos, chromatic scale tutorials on this channel, so you can look those up or I'll put those in the comment section here. Or if you go back and watch it again, I'll put a little card at this spot. It takes time to do it. I'm talking really quickly because I can only do 30 minutes in this today, but the chromatic scale is something that takes some people weeks and weeks to learn, and other people it can take a shorter amount of time. It just depends on how much time you can dedicate to working on the chromatic scale. So that's my advice. Break it up into little pieces and then put them into a little bit bigger piece. So five notes into an octave and then do two octaves and then do the three octaves and then add the extra couple notes if you're going up to the high G. So break it up into the little pieces up and down. The other thing is that's very important are, is to use the chromatic fingerings. So you wanna use these sliver keys right here and you wanna use the side F sharp key right there. That's really important as well. All right, so I know that was a fast one, but I do have some more detailed videos on this channel. Okay, I'm gonna to go to a couple other questions. Oh, you want me to play the highest note? So for me, it's the high C. Let me see if I can hear it. I'm one of those people that has to hear it. So for that one, the high C, and I can play it louder, much to the sadness, or longer for my poor family, but it's thumb register one, one. And then I put, I think I put the, let me see. Yeah, I put my pinky on the C key. Yeah, and you can also put it on the E flat key. That'll work there too. So that's a C. Um, so it's that double high C. This, for those of you that know, is also an alternate B flat fingering. Instead of doing this B flat over the break, you can do this one, the one and one. It's a lovely one and things like the Sans Sans Sonata. But by putting your pinky down here and raising your tongue in that E position, voicing it, hearing it in your mind, you can get to that high C. Okay, next one. Um, Hedwig's theme, can I play it? All right, if I have time at the end, I will play it. Isn't it pretty? I love that one. Okay, so um, Tyler, I noticed it on my wooden clarinet that when I get to about high F or G, my notes are really sharp, but if I pull my barrel out any farther, my mid and low notes will be too flat. Any tips? Okay, so Tyler, my question is which F and G. Are we talking at the top of the range, the altissimo F and G, or the ones right over the break? Now, I know you and I've known you for a couple years. I'm assuming it's altissimo. Will you just go ahead and confirm that in the chat, and then I'll talk about what to do if your altissimo range is too sharp or if your clarion range is too sharp. So I'll come back to you. Um, David Winfrey wants to know what I think of Leger reeds. I used to think they were just good for marching band. Or I would play them on my bass clarinet when I used to do a lot of doubling. I used to play pops all the time in the olden days when 
well, it's not quite old days yet <laughs> with the coronavirus, but when I do a lot of pops gigs, I'm doubling on bass, so I play a leger on my bass for that. Uh, the, the leger quality has gone up immensely. They're expensive, but they're worth it. They last a really, really long time. And the, the new ones they've come out with the past couple of years, there are plenty of professionals that play them instead of their cane reeds. I don't really like the way they feel on B flat clarinet. I prefer the cane reeds. And I prefer the flexibility of a cane reed just in case I don't like the Legere. I'm stuck with a really expensive reed that I've purchased, but I love them on bass. So a lot of people love the Legeres and they use them professionally. It's up to you. It's all personal. Okay, next one. Um, Horse, Cra Horse Craver says, hi. Hi. Um, when I play high D and I take my thumb off the back register key and don't use the note, um, still play anything. Am I back? I'm back. Okay, so um, it depends on which high D you're doing. I think let's, uh, will you say clarion D, which is this one, or high D altissimo, this one? It, it actually doesn't matter. So you think of your register key as an activation key. And if your voicing is correct, you should be able to still have the, the next register of the clarinet work. So it's actually a good thing if it still speaks. Obviously, if you're working on going from high D down into the shallow mo, low G, that can be problematic. You have to readjust your voicing. So I find I have to drop my jaw a little bit and change my tongue position for that to work for me. Um, in the Sans Sans Sonata, it has that where you go from D to G to D. And if you're not careful, it'll stay there when you leave that. But that's actually that you have a very good voicing internal cavity. But you do have to readjust to get those lower notes to speak. A game that you can play with this to see that you're getting that good voicing is to start on the high C and take your thumb off the register and then go down. And see how far down you can get. So that's actually one of the things I work on with my students to get them to get that feeling for the voicing. So that's a thing with clarinet. They, I've had students that can um, play taps. They stick us, so I've done it too, but it's really fun um, when my students do because they, can, they spend more time on it than I do. You can stick a sock in the bell and you can play taps on the clarinet that way just by, and that doesn't even need fingerings. That you can just change around your internal voicing and get those different notes that way. Okay, moving on. Um, okay, oh. That was just the overtones exercise, please. Okay, so um, I'm going to redo what I just did, but I'm going to change the language a little bit. Horse Craver um, asked about playing high D, taking the thumb off, and I don't use any tonguing. The high note still plays, right? This is part of the overtone series of clarinet. And then right after you, Music 8 asked about the overtone series of clarinet. Did you guys plan that or something? So the clarinet is called a stopped pipe. It is more similar to a pipe organ than it is to something like an oboe because it's not a cylindrical bore. Or it's not a conical bore. We're a cylindrical bore. What that means in layman's terms is that when we hit the register key, it goes up 12 notes, not eight notes. That's why this is not called an octave key for us. It is a register key. Our overtone series is um, sounds the twelfths of it. So. When you um, have that C right here, you do the register key, but take it off, that's technically the F, right? But you can still get that C to speak, that's the overtone series there. And you can hear that ghost of the undertones in there, and that's the 12th lower. You can go even higher. These are squeaks, but if you call them overtones, then everybody's gonna be all like, what, you didn't squeak? And you'll be like, no, no, it's the overtone series. I'm just activating different registers of the clarinet. So that's how it works on our instrument, which is a little bit different than all of the other ones, which are based on eight notes, not 12. Okay, here we go. Um, cat lover wants, oh, you're talking to me about your kitty. So with our six cats, well, I don't know if I can tell you, but we have another addition to the family. It's not a cat. Also, you keep pausing. Oh no, it's not your internet. It's absolutely my internet. I think I have 
my husband is at work on the computer and my son is playing Roblox and my daughter is watching The Office. So we are all sharing the internet right now. So if there's any glitchiness, it's on my side. Okay, Horace Craver wants to know what a bass clarinet is. Oh my gosh. So imagine this clarinet, but a whole octave lower is the bass clarinet. It's really big. If I can get my bass out real fast, I'll show you what a bass clarinet looks like, but it's like a really big clarinet. It has a loop neck, goes straight down to the floor, and then the bell is curved up and out. It's flared out. The bell, just if you didn't know, a little bit of trivia, on the bass clarinet used to be right down into the ground. But the composer Hector Berlioz was having trouble hearing the bass clarinet in one of his pieces, probably Symphony Fantastique. No, I don't think there's a bass in that one. But anyway, in one of Hector Ber Berlioz's pieces, he couldn't hear the bass clarinet, so he met with famous musician and instrument maker Adolf Sax of the saxophone and asked him to help him fix this bass clarinet problem, which is why the bass clarinet bell curves up and flares out because it's a Berlioz and Adolf Sax. So, um, but I'll try, I'm grabbing, my case for once in my life is nearby. Usually my bass is not easy to get to, but I'll pull it out and I'll show you some pieces compared to my clarinet so you can see how big it is. It's really big. Okay, next one. Um, Eddie is just popping in to say hi. Hi, you're at work and you will watch later. Awesome. And then David says you can actually exchange them. No way for the Legere. So if you don't like it or the strength is too, too hard you can exchange it I did not know that I actually stuck with a bass clarinet legere for a while that's too hard for me I play threes when I play a bass so I got a three and a half legere because I thought that um, it was a little different so this is just part of my bass I'm not putting the whole thing together right now but <clears throat> this is a little bit of the comparison I'll lean back a little bit so I don't even have the bell on the bottom but and I'll grab my bell just so you can see. So imagine this bell being facing down into the ground like that with the old bass clarinets. Also, how did they hold that? I really want to know. And then flip it out, and that's how it goes on the bass. And that's Adolf Sax and Hector Berlioz, which is a pretty cool story. By the way, if you're looking for a summer reading book that is absolutely insane, go ahead and read Hector Berlioz's autobiography. He is crazy pants. And it is one of the funniest, weirdest books I've ever read because he's very narcissistic. I mean, I think the dude played guitar, but he was going to become principal in France. He was going to become principal flutist of the New York Philharmonic. I mean, that's what he set his sights on. And th that didn't really work out for him. Um, he also would go to rehearsals of the Paris Opera and sit in the audience and scream at the conductor. He was not a part of the orchestra. He was just some dude in the um, audience. It's, but it's worth it. I mean, you've got everything in there. You've got an ill-fated love affair. You've got drugs. You have um, a dad that has a job that he doesn't want to do. It's, it's totally crazy. Okay, moving on. Um, Tyler, really every note from over the break, F or G, up into the altissimo seems to be pretty sharp. Okay, G, are you the one that has the Yamaha clarinet? Um, okay, pulling out the barrel, if it's over the break sharp, might not be working out. Well, it sounds like it's not working out. And then you can pull out from the middle of the clarinet when you're doing intonation, but that's really only helping this area. Once you get here and it's still sharp, there's a couple things you can do to fix it. And one of the ones I wanna recommend, Tyler, is to practice in a mirror just to double check Hi, Isabel. Just to trouble check that this hand is staying close. Sometimes when I have students that are sharp, once they're over the break, they're lifting up really high for the pitch by keeping your fingers closer. If it's still not working out, I would try maybe a longer barrel. And then if these notes are still flat in here, Try changing your voicing a little bit, lifting up your tongue and saying E, seeing if that raises that pitch for you. Um, and then it might be just a lot of time with a tuner and working on opening up your oral cavity, dropping your jaw and working on lowering that pitch. If it's still giving you trouble, um, try different mouthpieces and see if a different mouthpiece helps you. And then try 
um, and this is, you know, I'm trying to go in order. So the first one I would do is pull out from the middle. Second one I would do is keeping your fingers curved and close. The third one I would do would be lower or raising this barrel here, pulling out a little bit and then keeping your tongue high for um, raising that pitch, then trying a different mouthpiece um, and then going to a music or, or a clarinet repair guys or gal. If you have a clarinet repair person near you and you talk to them about this, they might be able to help you. I had a problem with that once and they, in one of my clarinets, they took out the um, tube in my register key and they redid the tube and that helped me. Sometimes they'll ream out these holes and they'll change those around. That you can change, um, you can change things like that on your clarinet. But really, the biggest one is your ears. So spend more, spend time with the tuner. Try and lock it in with a drone. Really try and get in there. But if you're finding that it's really difficult to do that, those would be the steps that I would look at. And good luck. That can be really, really frustrating. So I hear you. Um, I just want to let you know I feel your pain. It can be very difficult if it's um, if you can't get that fixed, especially if it's a clarinet related issue. Okay, horse craver. I'm getting a cockatiel. Oh my goodness, will he be in your room? When I play my clarinet, should I take him out of the room or keep him in the room? This is my favorite question I've ever gotten. So I don't know, I don't know what to do. So I have a friend who has an African gray parrot. I would definitely wanna check in with her and ask her what she's done with her African gray. I really, really, really hope you can keep your cockatiel in your room because I really, 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 really hope your cockatiel will sing back sing back to you because that would be just the most beautiful wonderful thing um i you know i'm an animal person all the way through if you haven't gathered that and a musician and a bird is on my list i definitely want to get a bird because i want to have that kind of um communication between the clarinet and the, and, and a bird but um i do recommend it for dogs <laughs> dogs usually don't like the altissimo range um, but I don't know about birds. That's a great one. Please, if you find anything out, send me a message. I really, really want to know the answer to that. I, I do know plenty of musicians that have birds though, and nobody's ever said anything to me about that. And I know birds love music because I like to watch the videos of them dancing on YouTube because those are the greatest. Mozart had a bird. He had a starling. We have starlings in America. They are a non-native invasive species because some dude decided that America should have, and this was early in the 1900s, America America should have all the birds from Shakespeare plays. So he went to Central Park and he released a bunch of starlings. They're European starlings and they're called starlings because they have the little specks on their feathers that look like stars. Anyway, he released a whole bunch in Central Park and they just took over and they're very damaging birds. But Mozart had a pet starling and he taught it how to whistle the, um, the some of the arias from the magic, nope, um, Marriage of Figaro, which is really cool. All right, I am running low on time because I have to get off a little early today because I have a clarinet lesson at 4.30. So I've got a couple more minutes. Um, okay, so, oh, I'm so excited about your cockatiel. Congratulations. Um, hi. Oh no, I don't know how to say your name, but you spelled it H-A-I. Hi. <laughs> Cat lover, I haven't played clarinet in a long time and I just thought about starting, but I just got my wisdom teeth out last week. Okay, Cat lover, let's talk about wisdom teeth for a second. Everybody, when you have your wisdom teeth out, that's a lot of trauma to your mouth. And one of the things that I learned when I had my wisdom teeth out was to give myself two weeks to heal so that you don't get dry socket. Because one of the things we do when we play the clarinet is that E tongue position I talk a lot about. You're putting pressure on the sides of your gums and the inside of your gums back there where your wisdom teeth once were. And that can actually be damaging for your mouth. And also the breathing might be kind of an issue. So give yourself some time to rest. And then when you get back into playing, go slow. Start with five minute increments and build up from there so that you can get your breathing back. You can get the strength of your embouchure back. Pay attention. If you're finding any pain in your mouth, that's when you stop playing. Rest. Try again the next day. If the pain is consist consistent, that's when you're going to just touch base with your oral surgeon and be like, hey, I really want to play the clarinet again. What are my next steps because I'm having this pain? So definitely make sure that they're part of that conversation if you're having any kind of pain. So give yourself another week, okay, cat lover? Um, and yes, 
that is a pain getting your wisdom teeth out. Um, horse Grabber in my ears. Um, horse Grabber plays Roblox. Um, and then Alexandra Wilson wants um, people to subscribe to her YouTube channel. Um, she plays clarinet too. I will show that everybody so you can jump in on that. Um, YouTube will hide some of those for people. Okay, um, Trif Triforce. Um, I haven't played clarinet in a while, and for high school in September, what are some good warm-ups for a clarinet player of three years? Oh, that's a great one. So I have, I don't have them written out as warm-ups on my website, excuse me, on the YouTube channel. I, in MuseScore, I've been putting up webs, or I can do this. In MuseScore, I've been putting up warm-ups recently, and one of my plans is to actually just do tutorials on warm-ups. So for coming into it after three years, one of my favorite ones to do is the B, B flat, B warm up. Nice and slow. That works on good hand position, especially your thumb in the back, going over the break, matching the sounds. And then you do B, A, B, B, A flat, B, B, G, B, so that you can have beautiful sound, good embouchure, great hand position. So that's one of my favorite ones. Okay. Uh, moving on, I love the bass clarinet. Oh, Tyler, me too. Playing the bass clarinet. If any of you get the chance to play the bass clarinet, do it. It is a blast. It is really, really fun. Um, I'm currently saving up for one. Yes, keep saving. Listen, and here's the thing. Check, and I feel bad about pawn shops because it's always sad to me when somebody has to pawn something. Check pawn shops and check thrift shops and just keep your eye out on Craigslist and let go. Now the risk is that you'll get a poor quality clarinet and we don't want that. So anytime you can, if you're if you're considering this route, make sure you play test it first. It's a, I had a friend that got a bass clarinet at a thrift shop for $50 because they didn't know what it was. And so every time I go out and there's a thrift shop nearby, I usually I just jump in real quick and I'll say, hey, do you guys have any bass clarinets? They don't know what you're talking about. And then you say, do you have any big clarinets? And just see. Um, sometimes I'll put a watch on. I'll just say, hey, if you get one, here's my card. Can you give me a call? Because I'm interested. So yeah, that's a place to find them. I usually um, do that for B-flat clarinets, but bass clarinets are so rare that, uh, not rare, but they're rare to find in thrift shops that usually they come in an okay condition because people have taken care of them. I have to get ready to go. I'm gonna wrap up now. But if, um, if, if a bass clarinet ends up in a thrift shop and it's, you know, $200 or something, then it's, a couple hundred dollars to get new pads on it and worked on it because it's in bad shape that's still a better price than getting um a, you know a used one right from the get-go that's ready to go or a brand new one so it's an option for you all right i didn't get to everybody's question i'm really sorry so save them um i will try and get in here and look at them and um, remember them for next week. We'll, we'll have Ask a Clarinet Teacher next Friday at four. I apologize for not being able to get to everyone. Thank you so much for coming. I always enjoy all of your questions. Have a great weekend. Bye.